Welcome back everybody to the Raid Mastery series, the place where I'll be revisiting every raid in the game, providing a concise modern guide full of tips, tricks, easy skips and meta recommendations. Today we have a strong contender for the easiest of them all, the first raid ever made, Vault of Glass. Entrance to begin opening the door to the Vault of Glass, you must capture three Vex sink plates located left, middle and right in order to construct the central spire that unlocks the door. Be sure to eliminate the Praetorian Minotaurs before they reach the sink plates in order to prevent them from being captured. One thing to note is that you don't have to be stood on the sink plates once captured, you're free to roam around or float with heat rises like you're seeing here. If you want to speed things up a little, any hunters on the team can perform the following skates to reach each plate faster. Confluxes. Loadouts wise, all players should be running their best ad clear setups, which for Warlocks is Sunbracers, for Titans is Strand or Solar, and for Hunters is Arc. Weapons wise, it's nice to have one gun capable of stunning overload champions like a Chill Clip Riptide, a Waveframe for ad clear, and Galahorn for dealing with Wyverns. The main objective for this encounter is incredibly simple, which is to prevent any Vex from sacrificing to the Confluxes. If a Wyvern successfully sacrifices to a Conflux, you will wipe. On round one, only the middle Conflux is spawned in. On round two, both left and right Confluxes are spawned in. And finally, on round three, all three confluxes are present. In the downtime between each round, the Templar will summon his legions, which now means that harpies and fanatics will spawn until the legions phase is over and the next round begins. If any players accidentally step in the radiolaria left behind by the fanatics, they'll become marked for negation and will die once the next negation ritual is completed. So to prevent this, simply step into the blue light in the middle to cleanse yourself. Now let's talk efficiency. Wyverns are a big part of the encounter, mainly because they are so dangerous, so properly managing them can significantly reduce the threat that they pose. The wyvern spawning system System for left and right is actually different to the spawning system for middle and as a consequence you want to approach each scenario slightly differently. For left and right wyverns, it's best to think of the spawn trigger as a beam of light shining down onto the arena and as long as that beam is still shining, wyverns will continue spawning from it. So, in order to get the least wyvern spawns, the best practice is to wait to kill the wyvern until it's about three quarters of the way to the conflux, which delays the spawn of more and ideally by that point the invisible beam would have dissipated, potentially making it so you only get the one wyvern. For middle, this beam of light is non-existent, which means that any mid wyverns should be killed immediately as there is no benefit to letting them wander. Also, if a wyvern spawns just as its corresponding conflux disappears, the wyvern will become desynced and could potentially become very dangerous, as it's now free to roam the map and you actually have a chance of seeing one of Destiny's most rare and terrifying phenomena, the rapid fire wyvern. I'll let this clip play so you can see what I mean. Holy sh Oracles. Loadouts remain roughly the same as this encounter still contains a fair amount of ad clear, but the players responsible for destroying oracles should now swap to Xenophage since it's able to one-tap them. Mechanically speaking, it's once again pretty simple where the aim is to destroy all five waves of oracles. The oracles must be destroyed in the order in which they spawn in, and each wave contains an increasing number of them. Wave 1 has 3, wave 2 has 4, wave 3 has 5, wave 4 has 6, and finally wave 5 has 7. The best way to do this encounter is to assign two players to breaking oracles and the rest clear adds. Both oracle players should stand in this spot right here because it lets them see every oracle spawn location. Observe. If you have someone who is super confident, the same spot can be used for doing solo oracles, but this isn't really needed. Interestingly though, each oracle has its own unique sound, which technically means if you can learn the cue associated with each oracle, you don't even have to look at them to know the order, you can simply decipher it from the sound. For any of you that are interested, there's a website called Oracle Trainer that lets you replay the unique sound of each oracle for learning purposes. And if you want to see this method in action, look no further than Mike's video, link in the description. Templar. If you're a fan of this channel, you've probably seen me here quite a few times doing damage testing. However, this time we simply want to eradicate him. The quickest and most efficient way to kill the Templar is to completely ignore the mechanics and just ego the kill. Rockets are the way to go, so make sure someone is using Galahorn and you've assigned one player on Tractor Cannon for debuff. You only need one Lunar Faction Well of Radiance and the rest of the team should be on their class's most optimal damage super, which for Warlocks is Needlestorm, for Titans is Cuirass Thundercrash, and for Hunters is Star Eater Blade Barrage. In order to get the quickest kill, you must perform what's known as Insta-Breaking. 
In order to instantly break the Templar shield, you must place the rally flag in the correct position, which is as close to the relic as you can possibly get it. The best way to do this is to use an eager edge sword and heavy attack to place the flag almost next to the relic. Once everyone is ready, the relic player should first rally to the flag, then pick up the relic in that order. If the relic player picks up the relic and then rallies, this won't work. If done the right way around though, the relic super should be instantly charged and can be used immediately. As soon as his shield is down, the relic player should drop the relic and start doing his own damage, giving the following result. If you don't think your team is fast enough to kill the Templar before he teleports away, simply have your Relic player block as many teleports as necessary to secure the kill. Gorgons By far the most foolproof and simple way of completing Gorgons is to have only one player run the maze and the rest kill themselves using either mountaintop or a weapon with ricochet rounds. Follow the route on screen to reach the end. Once the lone player is through to the next load zone, all of the Gorgons should despawn and the rest of the team will be automatically revived and can safely run to the exit. Keep in mind though, there is a bit of a weird interaction where the door to the jump puzzle periodically reappears and disappears, so make sure you don't get stuck in it. Gatekeepers Gatekeepers is yet again a drawn out ad player encounter with the main goal of preventing Vex inside the Mars and Venus portals from sacrificing to the central conflux in these rooms. There is really only one standout weapon that players should be using, which is none other than Tractor Cannon for reasons I'll get into shortly. Begin the encounter by killing the central gatekeeper which will spawn the Relic Shield. Assign two players to enter the Mars portal and two players to enter the Venus portal, one of which will take the Relic. Once inside, every few waves of ads in each portal room will contain either a Wyvern or an immune Minotaur whose shield can only be broken by the Relic. However, instead of having your relic player hop back and forth between each portal, it's actually just far easier to push the Minotaur off the map, which is where Tractor Cannon comes in. Simply apply Tractor to blind the Minotaur and push it off. Job done. This way, Venus can keep the relic for itself the whole time and kill their Minotaur with ease. As for the outside players, you could stand all the way up at the throne so you don't have to do anything until the portal players are finished, but honestly, it's just easier for you both to defend the sink plates as long as it's needed. What's even better actually is if you want to stop the spawns of the overloads altogether, there is currently a bug where if you throw a Warlock handheld supernova at the spawn door, it will stop working and won't spawn any adds at all. But again, it's not really that hard to deal with a 1600 overload here and there. Once the portal rooms are finished, make sure that the gatekeeper is dead to allow portal players to re-enter the throne and prepare to defend one final conflux in the middle. Three shielded minotaurs will spawn in a staggered pattern and shortly after three wyverns will spawn from each side and once defeated the encounter will be completed. Atheon Due to the existence of Time's Vengeance, the damage meta for Atheon is heavily skewed towards abilities because of the massive 200% damage increase given by Time's Vengeance. Because of this, all Warlocks should be on Solar running Verity's Brow Fusion Grenades since there are plenty of ads to kill for death row stacks and the amount of damage each grenade does is actually staggering. Titans should be running Heart of Inmost Light Pulse Grenades and Hunters should be on Solar, also on Fusion Grenades. Weapons wise, the star of the show here is Xenophage since for one, it's Solar which works nicely for Verity's Brow and two, it one taps the Oracles just just like before. The tractor player can run a solar sniper or to be honest any solar weapon works. Normally what people do on Atheon is some people die before the encounter starts in order to force the players left alive into the portal room and once this happens the dead players respawn. However, you cannot do this strategy on the first instance of the encounter because if you do there is a small chance that when the dead players respawn it puts them in a random location. For example, in the run we did to get footage one player respawned inside the Venus portal since they had evidently set their spawn there from the previous encounter. In order to avoid this the simple the solution is to rally to the flag for ammo and then wipe which sets your spawn in the Atheon arena. You could try setting your spawn manually by walking around and emoting in places but it's better just to wipe. Once you've all respawned, have the players who want to stay in the throne die, then break the box to start the encounter. After the teleport occurs, have the teleported players call out what side it is and by now the throne players should respawn. Instead of waiting for a call out, it's also perfectly safe to respawn when you see the light fading timer reach 1 minute and 32 seconds. Have the throne players read the following three sets of oracles which is made easy by standing 
standing up here on this ledge. A map containing the oracle callouts is on screen, but feel free to adapt it to your style. Not every team does front and back calls, some do numbers, which are also pretty easy to remember. After the third wave of oracles is cleared, damage will immediately begin, so hopefully by this point the throne players have been building up their stacks of death rows to jump into the damage phase at full throttle. Make sure you're doing damage right by the corresponding portal and Atheon should literally fall over. The best way to have a quick kill is to have only one person do the oracles which makes it so five players are already ready once damage begins, just make sure that the other five players die at the start to let this happen. And there you go, I think this has been the shortest guide so far but fret not, our next one has the potential to be quite lengthy. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Oh, what a go! Oh, so much better! <laughs> <laughs>